Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the uh, Friendship Sunday School class of Tap United Methodist Church in New Boston, Texas. My name is Tim Graham, and uh, we're in lesson number four on Christ's return. This week, we're going to be reading out of Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 32 through 41. And the lesson is entitled, As in the Days of Noah. Uh, there's a lot of good information in this uh, week's Sunday School lesson. As uh, as we begin, we're still uh, centered around the conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples right outside the temple based on what his return is going to look like. Uh, in other words, and man, it's uh, it's really, uh, when, you, when you take just a moment and look at it and dissect the verses, uh, Jesus is really letting his disciples know you need to be on high alert because even in the days of Noah, when he was building his ark, there were people, his neighbors, that weren't paying attention to what he was doing and just uh, thinking he was half crazy out of his mind, uh, but yet they failed to miss uh, what the signs that, that was happening around them. Uh, they were still marrying. They were still having children. They were still going about life as normal, despite the fact that something abnormal was happening just down the block. Uh, but anyway, a lot of great information. Uh, the people uh, that we would like to keep in our prayers this morning, all these recent graduates. Uh, I was down at Texas A&M this past week and uh, watched a lot of young people walk across the stage and get their undergraduate degrees, their master's degrees, their doctoral degrees. And I uh, really want to wish the recent graduates uh, that are graduating uh, from college uh, best in, uh, of luck in their job search. Uh, on their new chapter in life that they're about to embark on. Uh, and with that in mind, keep in mind that the high school graduates are right around the turn. At the uh, end of the month, there's going to be a lot of them. Uh, they're going off to college, going off to careers, uh, starting new lives. Uh, so keep them in your prayers as well. Also, their parents. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of elated parents down in College Station this weekend as they're getting a pay raise <laughs> and uh, their kids are, are going off and and, and starting their own lives. Of course, there may be a little anxiety. Some kids may be coming back home <laughs> to live with their parents for a little while while they do find a job. Uh, but anyway, pray for everyone involved in that aspect. Uh, if you know of someone that we need to pray for, you can list it here in the comment sections and uh, we can lift up a, a prayer for them as well. Uh, pray for our nation. Uh, we're really uh, a nation without much leadership or without much guidance right now. And we need to pray for our leaders, uh, especially the newly elected leaders uh, that uh, we uh, uh, elected on voting day last week, uh, that we uh, that they have godly leadership, that they seek counsel with wise people uh, to uh, to run these uh, cities, uh, to run the, the states, to run the nation, and even to run the world. Uh, just pray for them that they will seek godly counsel. Uh, but anyway, we'll go ahead. If you've got your Bibles close, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 41, and uh, we'll begin reading about Jesus's conversation with his disciples. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the son of man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we would pray that you'd grant us discernment, knowledge in the 
the facts surrounding your second coming. And Lord, even though we don't know the time and the place, you're relating to your disciples what the signs will be. And Lord, <clears throat> let the Holy Spirit come upon us so that we may better discern what you're talking about, that we may be better prepared for your second coming. Because Lord, we don't want to be like the ones left outside the ark in the days of Noah that were washed away in the great flood. But Lord, that's exactly what happened. The people were more focused on their lives and less focused on you. And they either ignored or didn't pay attention to the signs that were evident. And Lord, Lord let us not be so naive. Let us not be so ignorant as to your second coming. Open our eyes, open our hearts, and open our uh, minds to what you want us to hear today. All these things we'll ask in your name. Amen. Uh, it's really kind of interesting that uh, Jesus was, is relating his second coming to that of Noah, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure it was a grand historical event that people always talked about, uh, you know, the great flood, how Everyone was wiped off the face of the earth except Noah, but I, but I tend to think that everybody kind of forgets that over time, how monumental an event that was. But back then, everybody was more concerned with what they were doing. They, they uh, saw Noah building the ark, and I'm not sure how many people saw him, but I'm certainly there were neighbors because he didn't live alone. He didn't live on an island. Uh, he was just right down the street. But they were a vile and wicked people. Uh, full of sin and and God saw what he had created and he really wasn't happy with it so he saw the only remedy was to just kind of start all over we'll give him another chance so he sets Noah to the task of building an ark on dry land and Noah's not an ark builder so this must seem kind of strange to his neighbors that he's doing something outside his occupation his normal ordinary occupation and I don't know if he took time off from what he was doing. But in other words, he, I don't and no one really knows how long it took to build the ark, but just due to the sheer size of the ark, uh, I'm sure that it took a while. Uh, and the, when God revealed to him to build the ark till the time that Noah died was 120 years. <clears throat> so I know he completed it before 120 years was up, but nobody can really say how long it took to build the ark. Uh, but to, to build the framework, to build the, the bow from, from aft to stern, and then to start putting the sides on, to start building the, uh, the stalls inside, to part, putting all the hay and all the feed and all the food inside that it would take to feed the animals. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these animals just start showing up and walking up the ramp to get on the ark. You would have thought that people would have asked more questions. Hey, Noah, what's going on? but they were really more concerned with their lives and marrying and giving away in marriage and eating and drinking and going about their ordinary everyday lives. And it just kind of strikes me as odd that there weren't more people that were asking questions. We, uh, I went down to Texas A&M on Wednesday night. A good friend of mine, Paul Laywell was graduating and, and I knew months and months ago that, that Paul was going to graduate on Thursday, May the 12th. Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly when I uh, knew the time or was aware of the time that he would be graduating. But I, but I cleared my schedule on May the twelfth. I knew that I was going to be in College Station on May the twelfth, and and if the ceremony was going to be in the morning, I would probably drive down May the eleventh, where I didn't get caught up in traffic or have something else delay me from getting there in time to see him graduate. I cleared my schedule. I made plans. And it became apparent to me as I showed up down there with 10,989 others of my closest friends that a lot of people had cleared their schedules. They had made it a point to see their son, their daughter, their friend, their grandson, their granddaughter, their nephew, their niece, celebrate this accomplishment of graduating from A&M. And there were more than one graduation ceremonies, but, uh, but as I'm preparing to leave... On Wednesday night, I tell Christina, I said, you know, Terry and Angela Scoggins' youngest son, Luke, is going to graduate 
tomorrow. And from the, the looks of it, it appears that he's going to graduate in the same college that Paul's going to graduate in. Well, really, have you called Terry and Angela and let them know you're going to be down there? Nah, I'll, I'll run into them. They'll, I'll see them. And so Paul and I get there real early, about 8.45 on Thursday morning, and he walks in with all the graduates in the West Entry, and I go stand in line at the North Entry, and I haven't been in line maybe a minute or two, and here comes Terry and Angela Scoggin with their son Rocky and his girlfriend, and, and it's great to see them, and we stand in line to get in the North Entry to get in the auditorium, and then Terry's oldest son Josh comes in from Austin and a, and a niece or a uh, uh, niece and a nephew that are real close to, to Luke come in. And, and it's just uh, 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 people coming in from all over that have focused on this one event that's going to happen here. And it's just amazing to me how everybody cleared their schedule and then there's nothing that was going to interfere with this. And this was going to be priority one that we've all come to the same place to celebrate with our friends and family this grand occasion. Well, that's what Jesus is telling his disciples this morning, that life is going to get in the way, <clears throat> that, they did, that it did in Noah's day, that you wouldn't think that there's this strange thing happening, the guy building an ark in the middle of nowhere. You would think there would be more people asking questions, but there weren't. And that's the way it is right now in our world today. We're so tied up with what we're doing right now, we often ignore what's going on in the in the biblical realm. We're not paying attention to the things that are happening around us. We're so caught up, so self-absorbed in everything that we're doing. There, I was, uh, I kind of took a break from everything these last few days, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, because I wanted to be available for Paul, whatever he was going to do. But as I got back yesterday, I, I got on Facebook and, and noticed there were a few gender reveal parties and, and things like that going on. And, uh, and I was reminded of this lesson that, uh, you know, that when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he's telling them that people were raising families, people were marrying and giving away in marriage. They were eating and they were drinking. They were having a good time. And all these events uh, that are happening. And even my son Tyler came in this weekend and normally he doesn't come in out of the blue like this, but they were having, he and his friends were having a diaper party for Cole and Gabby. And, uh, they, uh, you know, cleared their schedules, came in, uh, Tyler's, uh, Reagan, uh, England came in from Belton. Tyler came in from Mesquite. And I'm sure there were a lot of other friends and, and family that came in from all over to celebrate this time with Cole and Gabby, this joyous occasion, they set aside everything that they were doing. But what Jesus is talking about in this, he said, learn the lesson from the fig tree, that when you see the leaves sprout, you know that it's summer is near. And even when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. So what are the signs? What are the the uh, the things that Jesus has given his disciples, this tidbit of information that he's passing on to them, he says, you, you need to be ready. You need to be prepared. Uh, Christina and I have a pecan tree in our uh, side yard that uh, that goes through cycles. Uh, you know, in the in the middle of winter, after it loses all its leaves and its pecans, it, it's kind of sitting out there barren in our side yard through January and February. But around March, things start to happen. The weather starts to warm up. We get a little bit of rain, and, and through April and May, it sprouts its leaves. So if you go out there today, I mean, it, it's a stark difference from what it looked like in January and February. So I know that spring is here, that it's near, and summer is just right around the corner. And when summer comes and we start to get near the end of summer, there'll be some green shells that start to form on that pecan tree. And inside those green shells, there's a pecan growing. And then around October, those green shells will turn to black and they'll split apart. And then a pecan will expose itself and either fall to the ground or remain on the tree for just a little while longer. 
But ultimately, all the pecans will fall to the ground. And we're prepared. We've got five-gallon buckets. We've got pecan harvesters. We've got pecan crackers. We've got uh, Ziploc baggies to, to store the cracked pecans. Because we know there's only a certain amount of time that we have to harvest those pecans before the squirrels will pick them up, before neighbors or neighbors will come by and park on the street and come over there and help themselves to pecans. We, we know that we've only got a little bit of time to pick those pecans, but we're prepared. And that's the way we need to be with Jesus' second coming. We need to familiarize ourselves with the signs that are going to give it away. Because we do not know the hour of day. It's not as predictable as the pecan tree. It's not predictable like the fig tree. We've got to be aware. We've got to be on watch. Much like they were in Noah's day, how they just ignored the signs and went on about their lives and did not pay attention to biblical guidance where God meant for them to obey his commands. He meant for them to follow in his word, but they strayed. They strayed. They got away from God's intent for them to live their life. And when God had had enough, when God was patient, he wanted everybody to turn back, but they wouldn't. He took matters into his own hands and he started anew with Noah's family. And even though these signs that the, the fig tree that Jesus is talking about, they're not the signs of the final end, but of the beginning. They're not the sign of the close of the gospel day, but of its full opening, the coming of the kingdom and power. There will still be time when these signs start coming for everybody to turn back to God, to start to obey him, to, to, to repent. There will still be time, but there will still be people that will ignore the sign. And Jesus goes on to say that, that there will be two men working in the field and one will be taken and the other one left. There will be two women at the grind mill and one will be taken and one will be left. Well, how can that be if everyone was prepared? Everyone's not going to be prepared. Everyone's not going to be aware of the signs. Everybody's heart's not going to be right. Everybody's not going to obey the commands. As much as God wants us to turn Back to him, there will be still be others that opt out not to follow him. With the fig tree, Jesus acted out a parable to illustrate the reality of Israel's fruitful fruitlessness and its doom. Just as the leaves of the fig tree advertised fruit, so the Jewish leaders claimed to be fulfilling God's purpose. However, the advertising was a lie. Under the leaves of their showy religion, their hearts were barren and unbelieving. They had missed their opportunity to repent and to bear fruit. And so the king pronounced his judgment. And I'm reminded of this, that our pecan tree, the pecan tree doesn't yield its fruit every year. Well, Tim, how can that be? Well, it's just, just the way it is. Not enough water, too much water, not enough water at the right time. There's a lot of things that are dependent on if that pecan tree is going to yield a fruitful harvest, yet the leaves come all the same. If you look at that tree in, in May and June, you would think that it's going to yield a bumper crop of pecans. But that's not always the case. That's just leaves. That's all that is. And the same thing with the fig trees. We've got fig trees in our yard. And they don't always yield the figs that the leaves would promise they do. But you know you've got a healthy, a vibrant, a living plant when you see the green leaves sprout up. But the fruit, the thing that you're really looking for, because we don't eat the leaves, the fruit that you're really looking for is to come later. And time and again, there's sometimes that the pecan tree and the fig trees just don't yield any fruit. And that's exactly what Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples in this passage. That even though the Sadducees and the Pharisees talk a good game, and they dress a good game, and they appear as if they've got the fruits of the Spirit. They don't. And God will pronounce his judgment on them. The fig tree represented a popular source of inexpensive food in Israel. And in March, the fig trees that had small edible buds in April became the large green leaves. And then in May, the buds would fall off and be replaced 
by the normal crop of figs. And this occurred in April, and the green leaves should have indicated the presence of the edible buds that Jesus expected to find on the tree. However, the tree was full of leaves and had no buds. The tree looked promising, but it offered no fruit. Jesus did not curse the fig tree because he was angry and not getting any food. Instead, this was a parable intended to teach the disciples a lesson. By cursing the fig tree, Jesus was showing his anger at religion without substance. Jesus' harsh words to the fig tree could be applied to the nation of Israel and its beautiful temple. Fruitful in appearance, but Israel was spiritually barren. So it all goes back to as they're leaving the temple and Jesus has his disciples look at it. In all its grandeur and splendor, it yielded no spiritual fruit. Sure, it was a great looking building. Sure, it was a magnificent, tall, long and, and a marvel in architectural design, but it yielded no spiritual fruit. And how many of our churches are like that today? They have sprawling campuses, beautiful stained glass window, ornate decorations inside the facility itself, classroom upon classroom upon classroom for young children to learn, facilities that, that the, uh, the early Christians could only dream about. But does it yield any spiritual fruit? And oftentimes I wonder. Oftentimes I wonder, does it yield any spiritual fruit? But Jesus in this parable says the temple didn't. The Israelites didn't. So God pulled his blessings from the people of Israel because they refused to follow his word. They refused to yield any spiritual fruit. They thought all their power was in beautiful buildings and political correctness. That's where they thought their power lied. But they were sorely mistaken. Well, what does the fruit of the fig tree represent? The fruit of the fig tree is a metaphor for the Jewish people. The fig tree advertised fruit, but provided none for Jesus. So the Jewish leaders advertised spiritual fruit from Israel, but actually offered none to God. So what does we as Christians offer? Do we offer spiritual fruit? Do we offer patience? Do we offer kindness? Do we offer uh, generosity? Do we offer the fruits of the spirit? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know. There are some churches that, that are better at it than others. There are some Christians that are better at it than others. But we had rather portray a, a clean, a squeaky clean image than offer our spiritual fruits and be spiritually fruitful, really help the ones that need help, be generous to the ones that need help. Well, what does the curse represent? The ones, the curse that befell the people who didn't represent any fruit. The temple displayed beautiful architecture, but contained barren ritual. It was ripe for destruction. Most likely Jesus was not limiting his condemnation of fruitlessness to the temple or Judaism of the day, the action displays his stand against all hypocrisy. Any religious people who make a show of bearing fruit but are spiritually barren. I was talking earlier about that uh, we were so focused on graduation that I really didn't pay any attention to what else was going on around the world. But Paul and I loaded up in the truck and we took a trip to Yoakum, Texas on Friday morning. And as we're leaving to go, Paul asked a question. I really wasn't paying attention. He said, why are these flags flying at half mast? I don't know. I mean, it's the middle of May. There's no, there's no, there's no reason they should be flying at half mast. So as good researchers do, I got on my phone and, and we looked at it. Why are the flags being flown at half mast today? And I'm almost em embarrassed to tell you this, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and Tell you anyway, because I think that you need to know, because this is a this is a stretch of hypocrisy that just can't be ignored. It was in memory of all the people that have died of COVID-19. The administration that's in charge in Washington now declared a day because there's a million people that have died of COVID-19. So they wanted to recognize the 
the uh, the people that have died, this milestone that we've reached, that uh, COVID-19 has killed one million people. And I don't doubt the severity of COVID-19. I lost a lot of good friends to it. But we murder a million babies a year behind the, the guise of choice and no flags are flown at half-mast. No mention is made of all the aborted babies. I just can't think of any hypocrisy that was more extreme than that. And there was a statement that came out of the White House that said, as a nation, we must not grow numb to such sorrow in reference to the million people that have died of COVID-19 in America. We must not grow numb to such sorrow. Yet we have. Yet we have. There are people out there that are confused that think abortion is a choice. No, it's not a choice. Pregnancy is a consequence. Pregnancy is a consequence of a choice. But we would have it today that we don't follow God's word at all in that aspect. That we would think the choice occurs after. There's another choice that occurs after that first initial choice. And it's that kind of hypocrisy that runs rampant in the United States of America and in the world today that God finds offensive. So we kind of need to be on the lookout for when the second coming of Jesus will be. What does it mean that this generation will not pass away? Well, I'm sure that the disciples that were sitting there listening to this thinking, well, man, it, it's going to happen in our lifetime. It's going to happen in our lifetime. It's confusing because it seems that he would be speaking to this world, talking about his second coming. And there's much discussion over what is meant by terms like generation and pass away and all these things. Good scholars have reached different conclusions. What is clear, however, that Jesus did not mean that he would return before his disciples died. Yeah, that, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. He didn't come back before his t disciples died. Matter of fact, he explicitly told Peter how Peter would die. So Matthew seems to teach us all the things that Jesus had talked about, tribulation, deception, temptation, persecution. They would come upon his disciples and others in that generation would see the destruction of Jerusalem as a foretaste of the return of Jesus. And uh, it also talks about the new heaven and the new earth where heaven will descend and come down to earth rather than the reverse of that, which we normally think about us going up to heaven, but it specifically states in the Bible that the new heaven will come down to earth. And sometimes we get confused. We, we think about the, the uh, in the Bible verse today, when he talks about there will be two men working in the field and one will be taken and one will be left behind and there will be two women grinding at the mill and one will be taken and one will be left behind. And we often think that the believers are the, gonna be the ones that will be taken. But it seems that Jesus is talking, and I don't pretend to know what's gonna happen. All I know is I need to be prepared. But it would appear that in today's verses, that the ones that are gonna left behind are the ones that are in joy heaven coming down to earth that the ones taken are going somewhere else. They're not going to spend an eternity with God and Jesus in heaven on earth. It would appear that that's what he's talking about. So maybe we've got it all backwards. Maybe we really don't understand what's going on. And I'm not really concerned with the details of what's going to happen. I just know whose team I want to be on in the end. So my only job is to be prepared to watch for the signs, to obey God's commands, to be ready when it does happen. You know, if there's if there's someone in, in our area that starts building an ark, you can probably bet that I'm going to be one of the ones, hey, man, what are you doing? Well, God told me to build this ark. Well, why did he tell you to build it? Well, he told me that he was going to send a pairs of animals here and that he's going to flood the earth here and when I get through with this boat, that he's going to flood the earth and everybody left behind, not on the boat, is going to die. 
Well, man, how do I get a ticket to get on the boat? Well, I don't know. Yeah, I want to know how I want to get on the boat. I need a ticket. Me and my family, we want to be on the boat. We want to be saved. People didn't ask that question during Noah's day. They thought he was a little off, but they didn't realize that God himself was talking to Noah and he would be the only one that would save his family. The king will return and he will return to rule as king when people are going about their ordinary affairs for in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Noah believed the prophecy and he made ready. He was prepared. No one, however, knew the day or the hour of the floods coming. But I'm sure when Noah woke up that morning and saw the animals two by two marching to the boat, yeah, the time is drawing pretty near. And one other thing that I noticed about this weekend is I was looking at all the uh, the celebrations, the graduations, the, the gender reveal parties and the things like that that were going on. I, I noticed there were only two colors that were associated with these gender reveal parties. Is it pink or blue? Boy or girl? You know, there was no one that was saying, well, we'll let the kid decide when he comes out. There's a lot of disinformation spreading throughout the world and throughout the United States of America. And maybe I'm, it's just because I'm in the state of Texas or maybe it's because of the people that I hang out with, the friends that I have that, that we all think similarly. We don't all think alike, but we all think similarly. That Cole and Gabby know what they're having. That Devin and Kara know what they're having. Science, science is advanced enough to they can determine the gender of a baby inside a mother's womb. And there's only two colors, boy or girl. And nobody's going to decide. The kid's not going to decide when he or she comes out what gender it is. So why would we try to spread this false information to the general public that you get a choice, that you get to choose? Well, it all boils back to the people in Noah's day. They were doing wicked and evil things, and they were going about living their life thinking there would be plenty of time to repent, and there's not. There's not plenty of time to repent. The disciples didn't think they had a whole lot of time. Why do we think we've got a whole lot of time? We don't. We don't. And the thing about it is, Devin and Kara are planning on having a child. Cole and Gabby are planning on having a child, and they're planning on raising that child and celebrating every uh, graduation, celebrating every soccer, football game, or, or whatever that child chooses to participate in. And maybe one day they will participate in a high school graduation. And then maybe one day they were to participate in a college graduation. But they're still planning on celebrating all those things just like in the days of Noah. But will they get to celebrate that? I don't know. There were no guarantees for Christina or I that we would get to participate in a high school or a college graduation. Fortunately, we've been through two high school graduations and one college graduation. But even though we're going about our lives, we are keenly aware that Jesus Christ is coming again and we will be prepared. And God has been very patient. He's offered us plenty of time and opportunity to turn and come back to him. But why don't we go? A lot of times we don't like to be held accountable. We don't like to be told when we're doing things that are out of God's will or out of that line. Our feelings get hurt. Uh, and I don't know when feelings became so important because there's many times in the Bible when Jesus offends people, when he talks directly and blunt and straight to people, even to his own disciples to the point of calling Peter the devil. Get behind me, Satan, for you do not know the plans that my father has for me. He talks to his disciples that way. He talks to the Sadducees and the Pharisees that way. He uses parables to convict the people that he's talking to. 
the parable of the good Samaritan, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the absentee landowner, the parable of the widow of the, the lost coin, the lost sheep. He uses all these parables to illustrate what his father's view is, viewpoint is, what his viewpoint is, how it will be for us in the end days, and how even the most unclean, the good Samaritan and the, the prodigal son can be forgiven by God. He uses all of these things to teach us lessons. This fig tree this morning is no different. There are people out there that have plenty of leaves on their fig tree, but there's no fruit coming off of it. There are plenty of church buildings out there that are grand, that they're ornate, that they've got the best audiovisual equipment around. They've got the best music teams around, that they've got choirs that 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 amaze everyone, yet they offer no spiritual fruit. So what Jesus is talking about to his disciples is that beware. Beware of the fig tree with all leaves. Beware of anything with all leaves and no fruit. For that's not what God is looking for. He is looking for fruit from the tree. And we need to keep watch. You know, when, when we think about keeping watch, most of that is kind of kind of referred to as soldiers or maybe a fort or maybe a military bunker where people are on watch all the time while the people sleep or they eat or they take care of planning for the conflict that they're about to embark on. Bodyguards, bouncers, and security guards also keep watch police officers, FBI agents, other government officials all keep watch. And all of these positions involve a similar posture. When we keep watch, we are on high alert. We patrol, we protect, we keep post, and we stand guard. In essence, we stand our ground, remaining prepared for whatever comes our way. And if a command comes from a higher authority, we are ready to move in an instant. The same is true when the Lord asks us to keep watch with him through the night hours. The word, the very word watch has always had a military connotation. The Jews in biblical times, as well as the ancient Greeks and Romans, divided the night by military watches instead of hours. Each watch represented the period for which sentinels or pickets remained on duty. This was the watch in the night. So what are we to learn from this lesson today, what are we to learn from the, the people in the days of Noah? Well, you know, our, uh, you know there, there were so many things that happened to me this past week that kind of pertain to this lesson. So it just kind of spoke to me in a way that, that a, a lesson had in, in quite a while. So what am I preparing for? What am I clearing my schedule for? What am I paying attention to? And as I focused solely on the graduation day for, uh, for basically about two days, two days solid, because I didn't really care what I had on my schedule. I had cleared my schedule. I had, uh, didn't really answer any emails, didn't really answer any phone calls, didn't really do anything like that. I was solely focused on one thing, and that was being a good friend to my buddy Paul Laywell and doing things that he wanted to do, kind of chauffeuring him around town, not letting him have to worry about driving or anything like that. But I was solely focused on that activity. But now that I'm back to life in the real world, I've got other obligations, and here we go, picking up with reading emails, depositing checks, and you know, going about my own daily life. But I don't want to get so busy that I miss the signs that are surrounding Jesus' second coming. I know I, I don't know exactly how he's going to come. But when he does, does come to fulfill that prophecy, things will be fulfilled. Things will be come to fruition, just like much of the news surrounding his birth. That he will be born in Bethlehem, that he will be born of the fruit of Jesse, that he will be born of a Virgin Mary. And then throughout his life, he goes on to fulfill a lot of those other prophecies and people were looking, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
He checks that box too. Yeah, he checked that box too. Yeah, this, this really is the son of man, the son of God. He is divine. This is the one they're talking about. This could not possibly be anyone else. But there are still people today that don't think he checked every box. That don't think he fulfilled the prophecy that Isaiah, that Daniel, that David, that all the prophets of old talked about, but he did. So why are we so quick to ignore those signs? If we're quick to ignore those signs, there's no way in the world that we're going to see his second coming because we won't be prepared. So get in your Bibles. Get in your Bibles. Find a prayer group. Find a study group. Find people that will keep you accountable and that you can bounce these ideas off of and learn from. I'm really kind of appalled at the lack of people that, that attend church. They're, they just don't feel it's necessary. And even when they do get into church, that's kind of like they, uh, kind of like leaves on the fig tree. Because if you're in church or if you're in Sunday school and you've got your head down scrolling through your phone, you're not really paying attention. You're not really looking for the things that surround you that, that could help you out to identify Jesus' second coming. So get, getting to church is only half the battle. <laughs> getting to church is only half the battle. Once you get there, set your phone aside. Bring your, bring your hard copy of the Bible. Don't be distracted by any of the other things in life that are going on. Set to focus on his word. Set to study his word. Set to have conversation with other Christians that can help you out in understanding what's really happening in these verses. And, and as thankful as I am that I get to do this every Sunday morning, it's only a one-way conversation. There's no dialogue going back and forth between other Christians. And that's why I'm thankful that I get to go from here to a Sunday school class and sit with other people and, and find out what they see in these verses. And they help me, help me to better understand what Jesus' second coming will be like. Find a church home. Get prepared. Because the last thing that you want to do is be standing outside the ark when the rain starts to come. Thank y'all for joining us this morning. And if you're looking for a church home this morning, Tap United Methodist Church will be open from 9.15 to 10.15 for Sunday school and from 10.30 to noon for worship service. We're located at 715 South McCoy Boulevard in New Boston, Texas, and we'd love to have you. We'll see y'all next week for lesson number five.